you. Well, it's really nice to be here um, and to enjoy some wonderful Californian weather, unlike the glum rain that's still at back home. But what I really want to tell you about today is some of the work that we've been doing, trying to understand this incredible variation that we get in animal coloration and behavior in the natural world. And um, in particular, we're not, we're not just interested in the function of these different color patterns. We're also interested in the way that they work in terms of the visual system of the animals that are actually seeing them. So really what I want to do is kind of split the talk into two halves. I want to first of all tell you about some work that we've been doing looking at avian brood parasites and in particular things like egg mimicry and what leads to diversity in egg coloration. And then I want to tell you about some work which is very much still at a preliminary stage looking at two new systems have been developing on studying animal camouflage <coughs> in the natural world, including in crabs and in uh, these Afrotropical night jars. And these might seem like two quite unrelated subject areas, but actually, as I hope to show you, there's some interesting links between these, both in terms of how visual information is used to guide behavior, and also how different selection pressures can lead to diversity within and among species. So starting off with avian brood parasites then, these are birds that lay their eggs in the nests of other individuals or often other species so that those hosts or those foster parents rear the chick instead of the cuckoo. So here what we have is a common cuckoo, one of probably the most widely studied of all the brood parasites. And here, um, what this female has done is she's found um, <coughs> a host nest, in this case a nest of reed warblers in um, some fenland in Cambridgeshire. She's waited for the right moment until these birds, the hosts, are laying eggs in the nest. And then she's swooped down, taken out one of the host's own eggs and replaced it with one of her own. And that whole process can take as little as 10 or 20 seconds, and that's her entire reproductive effort done with. She plays no further part in their rearing. And what happened next is um, one of the marvels of nature that outraged and astounded naturalists and people like Darwin in equal measure. The naked and blind cuckoo chick hatches in advance of the host's own eggs and proceeds to heave them onto its back and throw them into the water below so that it can look all sweet and innocent but <laughs> monopolize the parental care. And this can sometimes reach really quite extreme proportions whereby the poor host bird is feeding a chick which is significantly larger than itself. So this is clearly extremely detrimental to these birds, to these hosts, because not only do they have to rear a chick to which um, they're not related to at all, but they also don't get to rear any of their own offspring either. So partly for this reason, brood parasites are often used as a classical example of co-evolution. And over the course of evolution, we often get hosts that evolve the ability to detect and reject to throw out foreign eggs from the nest. And this then leads to various counter-adaptations on the part of the cuckoo, including mimicking the appearance of the host eggs to avoid them from being detected and rejected. And I've been interested in a number of related questions here. In particular, how do hosts actually detect a foreign egg in their nest? And what features of egg appearance do they use to throw it out? And in turn, what features of the host eggs is it therefore most important for the parasite to mimic to defeat the, these host defensive behaviours. And rather more broadly, we might ask the question of how can these co-evolutionary interactions escalate over time in different species. And one of the, the key points to make here is that these systems have often been studied from a human perspective, even though um, birds have a very different visual system from us, including additional photoreceptor types and the ability to see ultraviolet light. 
So something I've been very keen to do is to quantify these egg appearances and this rejection behavior in terms of avian vision. So I'm not going to go into any great detail about the methods. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions later. I just want to give you a little bit of information about how we can actually quantify egg markings just to make some of the later stuff I'm going to tell you about make a bit more sense. So first of all then, in terms of colour, the most widely used approach to model animal colours and animal visual systems is to take a reflectance spectrum from the surface of the object that you're interested in. And this tells you how much light of different wavelengths is reflected from this object. So something that looks relatively red to our eyes will tend to have more longer wavelength reflectance. Then what we can do is we can measure the spectrum of light that's <coughs> out in the field where this object would naturally be viewed, and this is called the irradiance spectrum. And the product of these two gives us an estimate of the light and the wavelengths of light that's entering the animal's eye when it's viewing a given object under a given set of light conditions. So of course, what we also need to know is something about the visual system of the animal that's viewing these. And fortunately, we've got pretty good information on the visual system of a number of different birds. And we know that they have four different single cone types, sensitive to ultraviolet, shortwave, medium, and longer wavelengths of light. And these are used in color vision, and they also have an additional fifth cone type, the so-called double cones, and these are used in achromatic vision, basically assessing how bright or dark something is, and that's called luminance perception. So what we can do then is calculate how stimulated each one of these receptor types is when viewing our object, and this gives us a measure of the so-called photon catch of the receptors. So an object that looks red to us will have more longer wavelength reflectance, which will stimulate the long wave cone type more and produce a larger photon catch value for this receptor type. What we can then do is go on to model these colours in an avian colour space, which we can represent by a tetrahedron here, where the centre of the tetrahedron is the grey point, so there's no colour at all. But as you move away from the centre, objects acquire a colour of a given type, and they become increasingly saturated or rich for that colour. And logically, as two objects move further apart in a colour space, the more different they should look to a bird's visual system. Note here that humans, we only have three cone types used in colour vision, sensitive to short, medium and longer wavelengths. And so we can represent <coughs> the colours that we can see simply in terms of a triangle. The fact that birds have an additional receptor type sensitive to UV it doesn't just mean they see ultraviolet light, it gives them a whole extra dimension of colours that they can potentially see as well. And what we can also do, and I'm certainly not going to go into the methods now, but we can do more advanced models of visual discrimination, which can predict when an animal should be able to tell the difference between two objects, and if they can, how different those objects look in perceptual terms. So the other thing that I've been very keen to do is quantify the spatial arrangement of animal markings, that is, their pattern. Because of course it's not just the colour of animal markings that matters, it's their arrangement over the body or the object surface that's important as well. So using digital image analysis, one of the things we can do is quantify various features of, for example, egg markings, and I'm happy to tell you about how we do this later, but we can get information about the size of the markings, how diverse they are in sizes, how much of the egg surface is covered in these patterns and how contrasting they are, and the way that they're dispersed over the surface of the egg. Okay, so we have those different measurements and I'll come back to those in a minute to tell you about how we use them to understand these birds' behavior. But first of all, I wanna tell you a little bit about the study system um, that we've done the most work on. So brood parasites are perhaps most widely studied in the North American cowbirds and in the common cuckoo, in particular in Europe. But actually brood parasitism seems to have evolved 
about seven times independently in birds, and that includes some really very understudied species, in particular in the tropics, including some of the African parasites, like this one here, the cuckoo finch. And the cuckoo finch is really interesting because it's evolutionarily very ancient. It's split from its recent ancestors about 20 million years ago, and it parasitizes multiple hosts at the same geographical location with very similar breeding ecologies, um, with very similar nest types. But those hosts and the cuckoo finch vary in terms of their egg colors and how diverse they are. And the, like the common cuckoo, the cuckoo finch females comprise a number of different host races. So each individual female specializes on just one host species. And so this is work with a really important collaborator of mine, Claire Spottiswood, who's at Cambridge. And Claire did something pretty heroic. She set up an entirely new field site in Zambia, which is not an easy place to work um, and has a lot of challenges, but a really exciting place to be. And on this field site, there are a number of different parasitic species, including the cuckoo finch. So Claire and I have done a lot of work together studying these cuckoo finch, uh, finches and the different hosts. So a little bit like the common cuckoo chicks, the cuckoo finch young hatches in advance of the host's own eggs, but it doesn't throw the host eggs from the nest, and I'll come back to that later. What it does do is it begs ferociously, and it basically outcompetes the host young, which effectively shrivel up and die of starvation. Mm -hmm. So the net effect is much the same. And this is the place where we do the work. It's an area of southern Zambia, a little bit north of Livingston. And this is the field site. It's a really nice area in the wet season. Um, you get these really tall grasses where the hosts um, lay their eggs um, in these nicely woven nests in among the vegetation. And so it's a really nice place to work, although there are a few dangerous snakes like black mambas lurking in these grasses that you have to be a bit careful of. And this is the main host, it's the tawny flank prinia, and it builds these nice nests, as I say, in among the vegetation that are woven together. They're really quite neat. It's not a particularly exciting bird to look at in its plumage, but its eggs are absolutely spectacular. So what you have here are extremely variable eggs in terms of colour from one female to the next. So one female will always lay the same egg type. For example, this bird here will always lay a, an olivey brown egg with little squiggles. Whereas another bird, she'll lay blue eggs with large blotches, and so on. And the corresponding host race of the cuckoo finch does exactly the same thing. One female will always lay the same egg type, but different females will vary from one another. So what we have then is this really exciting but complicated situation where we have extreme variation in the egg colours of the host and of the host race of the parasite. And we're pretty confident that the cuckoo finch females don't choose hosts to parasitise with the same egg colours as they do. They don't seem to match up their phenotype to each host um, egg type. So these are naturally parasitised clutches in the field these are the host eggs, and this is the cuckoo finch egg, and here we have another one. And here, basically, the female has got lucky. She's laid her egg in the nest, and the eggs are a very good match, and they're likely to be accepted. But this is what we often find. Here's the parasitic egg, and here the match is really <coughs> quite poor, and these eggs are likely to be rejected within a day or so. So one of the first questions that we wanted to know, or wanted to ask, was how exactly do these prinia hosts reject cuckoo finch eggs? Because we know they, they throw foreign eggs out from the nest um, very frequently, very readily. And one of the ways you can do this is by playing the part of the parasite yourself. You can basically take an egg from the nest of one prinia female and swap it into the nest of another bird. And so you're simulating parasitism, and then you monitor which eggs are rejected, 
and how the hosts, what visual cues the hosts seem to be using to do that. So what we find then is that the Prinia are using multiple different aspects of egg appearance that are all independent of each other. Primarily, they're using difference in colour between their eggs and the foreign eggs, but they're also using several different aspects of pattern difference, dispersion, pattern diversity, and difference in the size of the markings on the eggs. So they're using these different aspects of appearance to spot and determine which is the foreign egg. But perhaps what's most interesting about this is that those, these specific features of egg appearance are precisely those um, features which differ most between real cuckoo finch eggs and the host's own eggs. So what they're doing is something very sensible. They're using the most reliable information about egg appearance to determine which is the parasite egg and which is their own. So in many ways, that question is a sensory task. The question is, how does the host detect the difference between two or more egg types? But there's much more to egg rejection behavior than just that, because you also have to know, or you have to identify which eggs are yours. So it's one thing to be able to say, this egg is different from this one, but really what you need to be able to do is say, this egg is different from this one, and this egg is mine, so that you can correctly reject the foreign ones. And so this is um, some work that I did with Claire and also with um, a postdoc of mine, Jolie and Trishenko, um, trying to determine how hosts actually do this in the Prinia. And broadly speaking, they could, they could do it in two different ways. The first is they could use a very simple rule of thumb called the discordancy hypothesis, where they basically just reject the odd egg out in the clutch. So imagine you have a clutch that consists of four different eggs, three of them look very similar, and one deviates very strongly. Well, that one's likely to be the parasitic egg, so you should chuck that one out. The alternative is that the hosts actually know what their own eggs look like. They have some kind of learnt or an innate or an inherited template of their own egg appearance, and they reject any eggs that deviate from this template regardless of the frequency of those eggs in the nest. So one of the ways you can get at this is you can swap different numbers of eggs between host clutches. So here what we've done is we've swapped just one experimental egg. So we have the host eggs in the majority and the foreign egg is outnumbered. Here we have equal proportions of host and foreign eggs. And here the experimental eggs are outnumbering the host's own eggs. So if they're using an odd one out rule, we would expect that hosts would actually reject their own egg when they're faced with this scenario. If they know their own egg appearance though, then they should always reject the experimental eggs regardless of the frequency in the nest or the proportion. So combined, we've actually done 172 different egg rejection trials now on all on different female birds and in 93 cases those hosts rejected um, some of those foreign eggs. However, on only one occasion did a host ever reject only one of its own eggs. And on just two further occasions a host rejected one foreign egg and one of its own eggs. And in all those three trials the level of mimicry was exceptionally good so it's just possible they couldn't tell the difference anyway. So in the remaining 90 trials, hosts only ever rejected the foreign eggs, even when their own eggs were heavily outnumbered. So that seems like pretty good evidence then that hosts have some kind of template and they know what their eggs look like. But I have to say, I've always found the difference between these two strategies a little bit oversimplified. And to me, it kind of makes sense that actually hosts might be expected to, to use both of these approaches. And the reason is that both should have limitations. So if you imagine you use the odd one out rule, then if your eggs are outnumbered, then you'll end up rejecting your own ones. So that's a clear risk or cost. However, if you use a template-based approach, then the problem is that if you think about it, memory isn't perfect. 
how you remember the appearance of something doesn't precisely match up to how it really looks. And eggs will differ from one egg to the next, from one clutch to the next, and depending on things like the light environment. So what you might be best doing then is to actually use a template-based approach, but also to compare what eggs exist in the nest and to combine these different sources of information. And that's exactly what we seem to find. So this is different in the colour of the foreign eggs and the experimental eggs. They're in perceptual units, so basically larger values mean that the eggs are more different from each other. And these are trials where the host rejected um, the foreign eggs from the nest. In situations where the host eggs were in the majority, when they were in equal proportion, and when the host eggs were outnumbered. And what we find is, as the host eggs become increasingly outnumbered, they require significantly greater differences in colour before they actually reject. So here what you've got is a conflict of information between sensory and cognitive information, or tasks, and that uncertainty means the hosts are needing to have greater differences in colour before they can be confident enough to reject the foreign eggs. The flip side of this is that it could actually benefit the parasite then to lay multiple eggs in the same nest. So one of the ways you can get at this is you can take real cuckoo finch eggs and compare the difference between those and the host eggs and then plug those differences into the egg rejection models to predict which eggs should be rejected when you have different proportions of them in the nest. And so what we find is Cuckoo finch eggs are significantly less likely to be rejected when they outnumber the host eggs, but in particular, they're far less likely to be rejected when they have very good levels of mimicry and when they outnumber the host eggs. So this would suggest then that we would expect to see the same female repeatedly targeting and parasitizing the same host nest with multiple eggs. And that is exactly what you find if you look in the field. So from our naturally occurring data, from naturally parasitized nests in the field, two thirds, in fact, slightly more than two thirds of these nests have two or more eggs laid by the same cuckoo finch female. And if you remember I said earlier, these cuckoo finch chicks don't actually reject foreign eggs, um, the other ne eggs from the nest. They tolerate them alongside well, I think one of the reasons is, is because they're often reared alongside their own siblings. So chucking them out of the nest, you're going to be chucking out potentially one of your, uh, one of your nest mates laid by the same mother. And actually these two parasitic chicks can do pretty well together. It's very common for hosts to rear both of these chicks to fledging, and they both do pretty well as far as we can tell. So this is a potentially really clever way that the parasite is combining both egg mimicry and repeated targeting of hosts to get around these defences that the hosts have got. So one of the other questions that we were interested in is how can hosts fight back when they're faced with parasites that have highly mimetic eggs? What strategies could they evolve or refine? And very broadly speaking, there are two different routes that they might go down. They might improve their ability to identify and reject foreign eggs in the nest. That is, they improve their discrimination behaviour so they're just more likely to reject eggs that are similar. Or what they could do is they could evolve very high levels of egg variation. I've called it polymorphism here, but actually in reality it's continuous variation. So by having different females laying different egg types, it makes it very difficult for the parasite to match or to um, be lucky enough to lay her eggs in the nest of a bird with the same phenotype. So one of the ways that we wanted to test this was to look at three different species of host of these cuckoo finches that are found in the same place and that have very similar biology. And we conducted both egg rejection experiments and looked at how polymorphic the egg types are. So the first species um, is, the, is the tawny flag prinia here, which, as I said, has these extremely variable, colourful eggs. 
and is a very common host. But then what we have is something called the red faced testicula, which um, it also is parasitized quite often by the cuckoo finch and rejects foreign eggs, but to our eyes, doesn't really show the same level of egg variation. And then what we have is the rattling cysticola, which seems to actually be a former host of the cuckoo finch. It's not currently parasitized at our study site, and we know it hasn't been parasitized there for at least 40 years, but it does lay very variable eggs, it does reject foreign eggs quite strongly, and it is parasitized in other parts of Africa. So it's possible it's actually beaten the cuckoo finch at our site. So one of the first things we needed to do was to actually quantify the degree of polymorphism in each of these species, because it's all very well and good to look at them and say this one's more variable than another, but we need to actually put a number on this in terms of bird vision. And so what we did was um, to come up with a so-called multidimensional phenotypic space, which sounds very fancy, but actually really it's just a way of encoding the properties of an egg with a number of different attributes of what they look like. And then you can plot them in a multidimensional space um, and work out how much of that volume they occupy. So what we did then was we um, calculated various aspects of egg appearance corresponding to colour, uh, to the brightness and to the pattern components, plot them in a multidimensional space and then calculate how much area or volume they occupy. And logically, the more polymorphic they are, the more spread out those eggs should be and the greater volume they should occupy. And then we combine this with the egg rejection experiments where you swap eggs between nests and you calculate the smallest level of difference that these hosts need to reject a foreign egg in the nest. So what we find then is that the tawny flank prinia has by far the highest levels of polymorphism but in absolute terms isn't very discriminating. It actually needs... Um, fairly large differences in egg appearance before it will reject a foreign egg from the nest. The red-faced stickler, on the other hand, has low levels of egg variation, but is highly discriminating. It can spot the difference between eggs that are very, very similar in appearance and, can re and correctly throw them from the nest. And the rattling stickler is interesting because it falls intermediate for both of these attributes. And one of the interesting things is if you do this kind of simulation modelling where you compare real cuckoo finch eggs and host eggs and you calculate the probability of those cuckoo finch eggs from being rejected with these different parameters, we find that the probability of rejection of a red-faced cysticular cuckoo finch is basically exactly the same as the probability of rejection of a cuckoo finch from a prinia nest. So it's not that one strategy is necessarily better than the other, they just seem to be two different routes down which the escalation can occur. And one of the things we don't know is why that actually might happen. Okay, so there's various other studies that we've done on the brood parasites, but what I really wanted to do was tell you a little bit about some um, work that we've been doing on animal camouflage as well. And this is something that's quite dear to my heart because I did my PhD on animal camouflage and it's been something that's kind of been ticking over ever since, and something that I've come back to again recently um, with regards to some new study systems. So this is really very provisional work that I'm going to tell you about. And I'm not just showing you a random picture of a tree trunk. Um, there is actually something on this. There's a camouflage moth on this trunk, and nobody can ever find it. So I'm just going to zoom in a bit. And I don't know if anyone can actually see it now. just here. So here's the head and there are the wings. So this is, this is a wonderful example of just how effective camouflage can be as a mechanism of defence against a visually hunting predator. And of course camouflage is important in various other aspects of human life as well. It's long been used to disguise vehicles and even buildings during war times. And in the modern world it's being increasingly used to disguise functional but um, ugly 
human-made objects like satellite dishes and transmission masts. And it's still, of course, used in various other aspects of human life as well. <laughs> I don't really know what he's hiding from. So really, we, we owe um, a huge amount to um, the pioneering work of, of four key proponents of um, kind of adaptive coloration. And many of the, th in fact, pretty much most of the theories that exist today regarding animal camouflage come from these four individuals. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace, these um, Oxford zoologist E.B. Poulton, the American artist Abbott Thayer, who's having a bit of a renaissance at the moment, and the um, Cambridge and uh, uh, zoologist Hugh Cott. And between them, they came up with many of the main theories regarding animal coloration, one of the most common types being um, so-called background matching, whereby to facilitate camouflage, you should basically just look like the general color and the general pattern of the background against which you're found. And also, another key theory, that being disruptive coloration, whereby you use these strongly contrasting bold markings at the edge of the body, which break up the shape of the outline and destroy the kind of salient body parts so that the predator fails to detect <coughs> and recognize you. And these theories, as I say, have been around since at least the 1940s and in fact well before, but up until recently they were widely accepted as textbook examples of animal coloration with pretty much no experimental support whatsoever that they actually worked. And so about 10 years ago, um, with a few exceptions, this started to change and a number of research groups started to become interested again in camouflage and realised that actually there's a huge amount we really don't understand with regards to how it works. And so one of the things we did was to develop this artificial moth type system consisting of little paper triangles um, covered with specific uh, controlled markings with a dead mealworm attached, which birds love to eat, and then pinned to natural backgrounds in the, in the um, in, for example, in woodland. And then we can monitor their survival over time and very carefully and precisely control the aspects of the markings here in terms of bird vision to determine how specific types of camouflage could provide a particular survival advantage. And one of the things that we found was that disruptive coloration with these edge markings here does indeed provide a significant survival advantage over and above simply matching the distribution and the pattern of the markings in the background. So that's all well and good, and a number of studies have been done showing that many of the main types of camouflage that we thought existed do indeed seem to work very effectively as mechanisms of concealment. But predominantly, those have been done in artificial systems with these fake moth-type stimuli, or in aviary studies, or with economic-type optimality models of behavior. Thing is, though, we know very little about camouflage in real animals out in the natural world. So what we have is this body of theory that we need to start applying to nature. And part of the reason is, by definition, camouflaged animals are very hard to find. So getting good sample sizes is um, difficult. In addition, the main backgrounds that the animals often rest on and the main predators are often poorly documented. And so conducting a natural study looking at, at survival of real species out in the wild and relating that to camouflage has often been very challenging. So one of the things I've been doing is to try and address this and to set up a couple of new study systems um, trying to quantify how animals actually are camouflaged against their natural environments and what survival advantage this might bring. So I just want to tell you a little bit about a couple of these um, things. So the first is um, these guys. These are, this is a juvenile horned ghost crab from, uh, from this case, Borneo, but they're found all over Southeast Asia and beyond. And hopefully you can agree that their camouflage is pretty amazing against the beach substrate, against uh, where they live. Even down to having little red specks in their legs 
that match the red specks of sand on the particular beach that they happen to be found. And so, um, in particular, I've been collaborating with Peter Todd at the National University of Singapore to try and study the camouflage of these crabs. And just in case you don't believe me, this is how a crab looks like and how camouflaged they are when you're looking from a bit further away. They are really well hidden. So um, Peter and I, along with a student, Chao Pei Ron, were doing an experiment where we were trying to figure out why the juvenile crabs are so beautifully camouflaged, whereas the adults actually are really quite poorly camouflaged. They're very dark, they're, they're obviously bigger, and they don't really look like the background very effectively. But as sometimes happens when you're doing work like this, you suddenly realise something that's probably much more interesting. And we were looking through the photographs of these crabs and, and realised that they seem to be different colours at different times of the day. And so we started to wonder whether they were actually changing colour depending upon the daylight cycle. And so what we did was to quickly collect um, a bunch of these juvenile ghost crabs, take them back to the lab, and I then stayed up for three days and three nights without much sleep at all, photographing these over um, every few hours for these uh, periods. So this is a this is a juvenile photograph during the day, and this is the same juvenile photographed at night. And this is all controlling for light conditions and so on. And if you plot the change in coloration over this cycle, what you get is this nice change in coloration where the crabs are actually um, very dark at night. This is different from the background, but what they're doing is they're becoming dark at night and light during the day dark again, light again, and so on. And if you stick them into a dark environment, they won't change colour. So it's not just the amount of light that's doing this. What they seem to have is a, is a circadian rhythm that's controlling their camouflage from day to night. And this is the difference in coloration of the crabs against the background, the beach. So here what you have is the colour of the sand. It's basically light yellow. Here is the colour of the crabs during the day. They're basically becoming light and yellow. And here are the crabs at night. They're becoming dark. And so it seems like they have this circadian rhythm then that's improving their camouflage during the day to the beach substrate. And we think increasing their camouflage against shadows on the beach at night. And the interesting thing is superimposed on top of this the crabs can also change colour depending upon the substrate. So if you put them on a white background, they become lighter. If you put them on a dark background, they become darker. So they have these neat systems to enable their camouflage at different times of day and against different substrate types. And so one of the things that we're looking at next is the really tough job of going around Southeast Asia on these tropical beaches and sampling to see whether they are matching the different beach types that they're found on. So these are individuals that are found from Hainan Island in China, from Borneo, and from Singapore. We don't know the answer to that yet, though. So the other work that I wanted to just finish with is a study that we're doing again with uh, Claire Spotterswood, also in Zambia, but this time during the dry season, with Jolien, postdoc, and with a research assistant, Jared Agarol Wilson, looking at camouflage in ground nesting birds, in particular in night jars. And these are really quite um, interesting because there are four different species that are found in our study site and they each nest on different background types. <coughs> so here we have the fiery neck night jar, which always lays its eggs against dried up leaf litter. We have the Mozambique night jar, which, here it is, which lays its eggs on scorched, dried earth. This is my favorite, this is the freckled night jar, which for some reason lays its eggs on granite rocks. And then this is particularly interesting, the pennant winged, because females are actually generalists, and they'll lay their eggs on a whole number of different substrate types. So what we can start to do then 
is to determine whether different types of camouflage have evolved against different substrate types. And the interesting thing with the pennant winged is we might expect that individual females will start to specialise on particular substrates, just like host races of a brood parasite. <coughs> we also have the three different life history stages, the eggs, the chicks, and the adults, and we can compare how their camouflage differs, especially because they're faced with different predators with different visual systems. So in particular, one of the things we really want to do is to determine how the probability of survival is affected by the degree of camouflage against these predator uh, vision, visual systems. And that may sound like it's been done before, but it's very seldom been done in the natural world. And we also want to look at how camouflage is influenced by behavior. So as I say, this is very early on, so I just want to show you some provisional stuff. In particular, one of the things we're doing is we're documenting the main predators and determining which, what the selection pressure is in terms of different visual systems on, is on these different eggs. So what we've done is we've got a number of clips here. This is the lesser spotted, spotted gannet chomping on a nightjar nest. We've set up traps at each one of these uh, different nests, both to record survival and to document these. So these are banded mongoose. This nest is already a goner. I'm not saying they don't use smell to detect some of these eggs as well. And they, both those groups are dichromats, so they only see a limited number of color types. This, on the other hand, is um, a gray-headed bush shrike, which is a tetrachromat. It's got the UV vision and four different cone types. And this, um, this was actually eating one of the uh, eggs as well. And this video clip, though, the last one, is my favorite. These are vervet monkeys. Oh, no, I jinxed it. Hmm. Well, what you would have seen was a vervet monkey coming and eating the eggs. What a shame. Um, and they're trichromats, so they basically have the same visual system or a very similar visual system to us. One of the other things we find is that the behavior of these birds can affect their camouflage or vice versa. <coughs> in that if you look at just the pennant winged, and this is very provisional data, we find that individuals which flush the nest earlier, so they flee the nest when a predator comes near, tend to have eggs that are more camouflaged. So they're, they're exposing their eggs earlier, so those eggs need to have better concealment. And one of the interesting questions will be to compare these species, because the fiery nets really don't flush at all, and um, you can almost touch them, and their eggs really don't look that well hidden, whereas these other ones flee the nest much earlier. And then finally, a recent study by Lovell and colleagues in an aviary um, experiment showed that, domestic, uh, showed that quail, um, when you give them a choice of different substrates to lay on, they'll actually <coughs> pick a substrate that camouflages their own individual eggs more effectively. So if you give them a light-colored substrate, um, females with light-colored eggs will choose it, whereas females with dark-colored eggs will tend to choose dark substrates. <coughs> So what we're doing then is comparing the camouflage of the eggs where the night jars have laid against the immediate surrounding area, the wider area, and against other trans eggs to see whether they seem to be selecting particular backgrounds. And so far, this is again very provisional, but is marginally significant. They do, at least for the pennant wings, have better camouflage for the background that's immediately around their eggs than for any of these other background types. So it's interesting to think about how behavior can mediate the effectiveness of camouflage. And also it's interesting because it implies that these birds 
know the appearance of their own eggs, just like a host of a brood parasite uh, seem to do. Okay, I'd probably better leave it there. So I think I'll just say a big thanks to everyone involved with these studies, and in particular, uh, well, not in particular, as well as the local field assistants who really make a lot of this work possible. Um, and thanks to you for listening. Questions? Um, so, do, you, do you think the crabs are syncing up at all with the tides? That's another kind of circadian rhythm. Yeah. The sand changes color. I think so. I mean, you do see that in fiddler crabs. They don't seem to change, well, it's unclear, but they don't seem to change color for camouflage. Um, but you do get um, tidal and lunar cycles in their color change as well. And these ghost crabs, there's, there's quite a bit of noise. So that, that graph I showed you was one of the nicest the cleanest ones, shall we say. But you do get noise across individuals, and I think that might relate to where they are up on the beach and the, and the, the height on the beach. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, um, with the quails, and maybe back to the finches, do you see a difference between the first clutch laid and subsequent clutches? Do they get better mm. at knowing their own eggs after mm. seeing them, or they have already? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, there, there's some evidence from brood parasites that um, they seem to learn the appearance of their own eggs. It's not, um, it's not inherited, or at least not completely inherited. But how that might get refined over generations is, is really poorly understood and known. It's kind of assumed that they learn the appearance of their eggs in the very first clutch, but that I don't think there's really much much work that's been able to show or <coughs> test whether they change other subsequent clutches. And these birds are quite long lived, so it's absolutely feasible they could be looking at that over, a, over several years. Um, the quail, I think, are particularly interesting because it, it's been difficult to determine whether these templates are inherited or whether they are learnt because of the challenges of studying this in the field and knowing which are first time breeders and which aren't. But the quail are good because you could, in theory, take them in the lab and you'd, you'd know which are first-time breeders and not. So you could really start to tease apart those questions. But at, at the moment, we, we don't really know. Um, yeah. So uh, each individual egg, uh, why couldn't the uh, host memorize the signature sort of zebra code of each individual egg and then uh, see that uh, that one doesn't match uh, you know, the code? there'd be enough variation between the eggs where they have a, a uh, distinct signature, say? Um, well, I mean, it, it comes down to, I mean, there's variation between eggs. So you, you couldn't, if you memorized just one egg perfectly, you'd start chucking out your other eggs because they would deviate. Um, no, I mean, as you lay an egg, then you look down and say, well, let's see, yeah. this is uh, what it looks like, and I have that in my memory. And anything that departs from that, uh, I chuck out. Um, yeah, y yeah, you can do that. I mean, but as I say, that you've got changes in light conditions going on. You've got changes in the angle that the eggs are. They get rotated in the nest as they're incubated, and the spotting is not the same on one side to another. So, if you started to have a very, very specific template like that, you would almost certainly make recognition errors and start chucking out your own eggs. Yeah. So there has to be some flexibility about it. Otherwise, otherwise it's too um, it's too risky. I think. Yeah. Is there any indication that the night jars manipulate the background, or if something makes their eggs more conspicuous, do they manage their background? I don't know. That's a good. That's a really good question. I mean, we are we are recording these a lot. We've got huge amount, of <laughs> many many hours of video recording that we haven't been through yet. We've been obviously focusing on the predation aspects so far, but we've got neat video of them feeding at night and things like that. So there's the potential to look at that kind of behavioral stuff. It's possible. It's possible, yeah. Also, why would camouflage work for a night feeding mammal? Well, I mean, I think they're not just going to be there at night. That was, I think, as far as I remember, that was crepuscular, um, or it was, it was sunset-type time. So, I mean, certainly, 
um, we're not ruling out other cues. I mean, things like odour are likely to be important for at least some of these um, predators, and that it doesn't mean that other things are not being used as well. Yeah. yeah. With the, the manipulative experiments with the cuckoo finches, is there is there concern about the influence the researchers have on the cuckoo finch hosts, so that they see that you're taking out an egg or putting an egg in, or that they can smell that you've handled an egg that mm. you've added to the nest? Is there um, yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a perfectly um, valid point. I mean, it doesn't seem. I mean, the only thing I can say is it doesn't seem to matter if you just handle them and put them back. They don't just seem to reject them because they smell different or something. It really, I mean, you know, then they often don't reject when you put foreign eggs into the nest as well. It really does seem to be mainly driven by visual cues. That said. Um, the egg rejection experiments that we do don't explain all the variance in rejection. There's a lot of stuff that we don't explain, and that could be down to other things, um, like that, like odor, for example. And but it's, it's certainly other things make a difference, like the age of the female and the experience of the female. So we can't rule out completely other stuff like that. Yeah. So the cuckoo finch seems like a great system for negative frequency dependent selection. Yeah. Do you see evidence of that? Yeah, we do. I didn't. I didn't present it today, but yeah, we have. We've, we're really fortunate because um, there was a study. There was basically a, a retired army officer, a major, who was a bit of a bit of a fanatical egg collector. He was stationed out in Zambia at exactly the same field site where the modern work is done, and so he collected many eggs of um, a whole number of different species, but including the cuckoo finch and the hosts. And so we've basically got two snapshots in time one from about 40 years ago and one from today. And we do find really quite um, substantial changes in egg coloration from those two time periods. And of course, there could be other things going on that we have to account for as well, uh, egg fading, stuff like that. But there really do seem to be strong changes in the, in the population. For example, the cuckoo finch females um, really laid mainly um, red and white eggs about 40 years ago. and Virtually no blue eggs. Now the blue eggs are really common. Yeah. Is there some consideration that the older collection might be um, biased based on mm. the, the preferences of the person collecting? Yeah, I mean, of course, those kind of things you have to be careful about. Um, I, I think actually, um, the one of the nice things that he did is he noted he, he made meticulous notebooks so he noted down every nest he found even the ones he didn't collect and noted the colours of the eggs so we've been through those and there's no evidence that he was preferentially collecting certain colours and if anything it would probably make the analysis conservative because what we find is that the eggs are, in the modern day collection are more diverse they've spread out more whereas I think if generally I don't know maybe this isn't right but if you're sort of a collector and you're looking for particularly exciting eggs, you'd pick the extreme ones. So um, we can't rule out that kind of thing completely, but it's, I think it's very unlikely that bias is affecting that, yeah. So I wanted to ask a question about uh, learning on the part of the cuckoo finch. So you mentioned that they don't choose nests that have similar mm -hmm. colored eggs to the eggs that they're laying. Yeah. But I was wondering that having chosen to lay an egg in a nest, could the bird then observe whether it's a good match or not and preferentially yeah. return and increase the clutch size subsequently on those nests where it sort of hit the jackpot and got a good match? Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, they could do. And it, it's a bit puzzling that they don't seem to um, match up their eggs a little bit because given that hosts have got the ability to learn the egg types, you would think the cuckoo finch may have that ability as well. It's, I suppose it's possible that what we're seeing in these mismatched eggs is um, uh, very early cuckoo finch breeders. Um, and then what they're doing is they're refining it over time and then they are choosing a little bit. Um, so that is possible. That is possible. But certainly there are loads and loads of potential host nests in the environment they could use. They do, they don't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any kind of spatial arrangement or anything like that about what they're choosing. But yeah, it's a good point. But even the third, second egg, third egg is just as likely to be a mismatch as they don't improve with those subsequent uh, eggs. Well, if it's well matched, because they, they always lay the same egg type, 
So if it's well matched to begin with, the first, the, if the first egg is well matched, the second egg will be well matched as well because each bird always lays the same egg type. So that's the case, yeah. Do you know the proportion of nests that are parasitized and the proportion that are predated in some of your host species or not? Because you painted a picture of parasitism as being the worst thing that can happen to a host. I'm wondering if that's true. Um, no, predation is pretty awful as well. Um, the, we, we've estimated about 20% is the parasitism rate on the prinia, although it's probably slightly higher because we're probably missing eggs that were really poorly matched and rejected before we got to them. Um, but predation, um, I think, is about maybe a third or even higher than that of all nests. And they, they, they get hammered, the prinia, pretty by a number of angles. And then they, in, when they get hammered by predators, they'll build again and re-nest. OK, so no more questions. I want to just make a comment. Um, and that is that we've done something rather extraordinary with Martin Stevens in that we got him over from Britain by combining the invitation here with an invitation to UCLA and to Santa Cruz. And I'm saying that because we ought to be thinking about this kind of move next year and in subsequent years. It is possible to bring people over from other countries, providing we get together with other UC campuses. And on that uh, note, I'd like to thank Martin for a great talk. Really clean slides, beautiful slides.